So recently I watched two booktubers defending their senpai J.R.R. Tolkien against the supposed attacks of an anarchist. Needless to say, they were wrong and the video is a huge pile of crap. One might even call it epic poo. So I'm here to stir the shit. Cheers. <clears throat> All right. Epic Poo is a 1978 essay by British fantasy author, editor, and anarchist Michael Moorcock. And when you look at YouTube, you'll find two videos on it, which is very little because this is a hugely influential essay. Um, I'd say go and watch Liam's, one from Liam's Lyceum, because it's actually pretty good. But I feel there's room to expand what's going on with this essay, why it is important, what it is actually trying to do, and how much it is really about Tolkien. So let's do that, shall we? All right. So what's the statement of Epic Poo? It is, well, fantasy literature is hugely popular. A specific brand of fantasy literature is hugely popular, and that's the one that is following J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings because of the success of Lord of the Rings. And that's a problem because it's actually not really that good and takes over stuff from Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> that's the argument, and um, we'll see whether that's true, whether that's not true, but we'll also have to look at like how Michael Mocock makes that argument and why he makes that argument, because there is a larger context here that kind of gets dropped, because really it's not so much about Tolkien. It's about everyone else and how they relate to Tolkien. That's the problem. So first, we'll look at the structure of the essay and the argument, then we'll look at the context of the whole thing, and then we'll see where this will take us. All right, so, structure of the, uh, of the argument is fairly simple. Michael Moorcock sets out to look at the state of things. That is, Lord of the Rings is hugely popular, and people think it's a very good book. Some may even call it one of the best pieces of literature from the 20th century. That's sort of what he states. And he says, well, I disagree. And uh, then he states that a lot of people are copying what Lord of the Rings does, and what Tolkien does in Lord of the Rings. He's like, that's, that's even worse. So let's examine why Tolkien's writing is so popular, and then let's see whether there are alternatives. All right, so... Why is Tolkien's book so popular? He looks at what specific part of fantasy or fantastic literature um, Lord of the Rings is an example of. He calls it high fantasy. He says the prose is kind of bad, but even more, the ideas behind it are the problem. So he claims that it is mere escapism into a harmless world. It is coddling the reader. It is making it very easy to just disappear in Middle-earth because things will get sorted out in Middle-earth. And um, that's his main issue with Lord of the Rings right there. He does, and this is important, he does state that out of that specific field, the Inklings, C.S. Lewis, all those people, that, um, that, that specific group that Tolkien grew out of, um, Tolkien's work is by far the best and has great moments. He points that out. The argument is more that people seeing the success of Lord of the Rings copied the bad parts and think that makes great literature. That's, that's all there is to the criticism of Lord of the Rings. Everything else is a criticism of the state of fantasy literature at large. All right, so let's look at how he does that. And there's a twofold thing going on here. I already mentioned that, right? What he does, first of all, is he looks at the messages, the themes of that specific form of fantasy literature, and he looks at the style. And his argument is that the style reinforces or expresses those themes, is an expression of those themes that lie behind it. And he does give a lot of examples where he claims this is superior prose to something else. And um, I am not a professor of English literature, so I will not go in there and um, <coughs> judge these parts of the argument. But I don't have to. I can focus on the other arguments and see where we're going with that. Needless to say, though, the party picks from Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis 
does come across as kind of problematic, um, uh, or as worse than anything I've read in Lord of the Rings, and even worse, you know, than a lot of other fantasy that I've read at the time. So, what's the themes in there? So, Michael Mocock's claim is that a specific form of fantasy is escapism, and is not against escapism. There's a great quote in there that I will not be able to quote because I can't read. But basically, his point is there that escape that literature, every ki any kind of literature's goal is to give us escape from our fears, our anxieties, and also make us think about the sources of that. We can flee into an imaginary world, but we need to come back with some thought of what made us flee in the first place. There has to be a point to the escapism and not just leaving all our stress behind. We should come back stronger to actually change our world. That's Michael Moorcock's position on escapism. And he says, Lord of the Rings and a lot of fantasy that follows that specific model, that is much closer to children's literature or a specific aspect of children's literature than anything adult human beings should read, or children for that matter, is not delivering there for political reasons or sociological reasons and those are rooted in, well, the background of people like C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. Which is where we come to the politics. <clears throat> middle English, middle class, um, middle English, middle class Toryism is the charge here. See, it's very obvious, and we all know that, that Tolkien is not a fan of mod modernity. Neither is C.S. Lewis. There is that idea, and the point is that Mokok makes, and I go with it for once, um, is that ever since the beginning of industrialization, people have felt that the world has moved on, to quote Stephen King, and um, industrialization bad, nature great, but it's unfortunately lost nature. So what we do, Mokok's argument here, is we flee into books that give us a pale glimpse of that lost nature. We can linger there, melancholy, and also, you know, not do anything about it. Mukok's argument is that that's bullshit. Beautiful nature is still out there. It's actually more accessible nowadays than it was ever before. Now, this is obviously written in the 70s and does not take things like climate change into account, but he has a point there. It's like, if you think that everything has already been done and the good has passed, you will never go out and actually try to find it in the here and now, or maybe go and make sure that there is beautiful things out there. So he has a point there, and he does make that on the side. <clears throat> there are other elements there, and I think that's, that's his huge argument. He claims that a lot of this fantasy, Tolkien included, um, praises the middle class. He also points out G.K. Chesterton here. It's another author that fits into that area. It's like the ideal character in these worlds is the small person, the, the, the small and simple country folk, the farmers, um, the craftsmen, those people, because they are the last to complain about anything. They are the salt of the earth. And ideally, they do what they're told. Um, and that's sort of the ideal held up by a lot of this fantasy. And yeah, he's got a point there. And he says, like, that's, that's a problem because we don't want humble people doing what they're told. We want people to think for themselves and actually go out and change the world. So yes, this is a political argument, of course. And he says that we can see that in the way the prose describes things. And he has a point there, right? He has a point that he picks, obviously, a very specific opening part from, like, Lord of the Rings, from Fellowship of the Rings, where we have the conversation and the Green Dragon in Bywater when they talk about the selling of Bag End. And the language is sort of condescending while at the same time, and I think that's the condescension is sort of the, the issue here, right? It, it, it shows how kind of ridiculous but also endearing it is that those little hobbits have nothing else to talk about but the selling of their neighbor's cottage and they forget all the dangers of the outside world over it. And isn't that, isn't that cute and isn't that neat? And that's exactly the point here, right? It's like you, the reader and the author, are in favor of that because it is endearing, cute and all of that, but you're sort of aware that it's also slightly ridiculous. It's, it's, it's the whimsy in there that is 
so infuriating to someone like Michael Moorcock. And he claims Lord of the Rings does further that. And C.S. Lewis does the same with Narnia books and others even more so, and other authors even more. And that's that's his main reason where, I, where he thinks that these books are. Um, showing a very specific, showing a very specific image of society, and making it very easy to see that as the ideal state of society. See, that's the point. You should not read Lord of the Rings and say, "I want to be like one of those people in Bywater and the Green Dragon." That's not the goal. The point is that you should see that world presented there as the ideal world, where you sort yourself in there is a different point. But it does not want the world to change. That's. That's why this is so problematic for someone like Michael Moorcock. <clears throat> he then goes on to look at all kinds of authors influenced by that. He points out that there are basically two sides of it. One of them is children's books that use the same kind of thing. He then, you know, shows like, you know, stuff like Lloyd Alexander. He has a long list of those and points out like how it's kind of condescending even to children to treat them like that, which is where he brings in Winnie the Pooh. Now, I personally love Winnie the Pooh, but I have to admit he has a point. See, I love Winnie the Pooh as an adult, because as an adult, I see all the sly winks and nudges that are in that book that are sort of meant to fly over the child's head, right? It's a cute story about a bear and a rabbit and all of that stuff. And as an adult, you're like, wow, there's a lot of stuff packed in there that will totally not actually reach the child. Unless you're a bright child and you feel talked down to or talked over your head, like it feels almost like A.A. Milne is <clears throat> talking over the child's head to the parent and the medium is the children's story. And I, I see that point in that criticism. There's that condescension again. I personally don't like condescension, so I, I get his point. And yeah, that reflects when we see the tone that Tolkien adopts when he talks about the people in The Green Dragon in Fellowship of the Rings. I, I get the point. It's like, you the reader see how ridiculous it is, but isn't it also cute? And shouldn't we just protect those people from themselves and the outside world? And you know, changes in the world and keep the status quo. That's that's the argument. He then goes and shows like newer children's books that this, do the same thing. He also points out a few books that, in his words, take the child or the reader more seriously. And he mentions, and that's I think the important bit here, he mentions the fact that those books are still better than fantasy, epic fantasy books that try to copy or follow something like Lord of the Rings for commercial reasons, um, but are aimed at adults. Because, yeah, if you use sort of simpler worlds or whatever, and your goal are children, or, yeah, then that's understandable. Children don't have to read Karl Marx. They can read children's books. <laughs> children don't have to go and read Thomas Pynchon or uh, William S. Burroughs. I'll remember why, but I'll remind you while I mentioned Burroughs there in a moment. But the point is, that's fine. But as an adult, if you choose to read the same books, feeling slightly talked down to, um, feeling coddled by the author, then you're selling yourself short, and you're retreating from the reality of the world with no goal, with with no intention to actually change anything. You don't want to face the problems of the world, even though they might be presented to you through the escape into, a, into an imaginary world. No, you've given up. You just retreat further and further and further. <laughs> he has that wonderful image there when he talks about um, <clears throat> those people not even wanting the lotus of the lotus eater, but just a mild British cabbage, which I think is wonderful and works really well with his like images of Peter Rabbit and Watership Down. <clears throat> but he, he's got a point there. An argument, the argument there is, Fantasy written for adult people should actually take the reader seriously. Fantasy for children should also take the reader seriously, you know, as children. And that is sort of where his argument goes. Like, the fact that fantasy aimed at adults is copying J.R.R. Tolkien's slightly condescending tone and goal of keeping the status quo alive and presenting it as slightly ridiculous but also endearing. Um, that leads to a, you know, general, like, he calls it dumbing down. I wouldn't call it that, but you know what I mean? He does go, he does go down that road. And so it's like, that's a problem. That's a huge problem because at the end of the day, 
we come to a point where Tolkien shines and stands head and shoulders above other fantasy. He sells more, Lord of the Rings sells more than anyone else, but all the other fantasy follows that example, follows it badly. That's the point, and we still think it's great. It leads us as readers down into a place where we can't actually discover great books, we can't actually go and change the world, do things, because of all that candy cotton surrounding us, because we're coddled by our authors as readers. That's that's the key of his argument. And he doesn't blame Tolkien for it. Like, Tolkien is obviously the person of his time, of his background, and so forth, but the structure in which Tolkien makes this argument, um, make, wrote his text, is important. And the fact where we are right now is the next part, which is like, you know, how certain books are given to us. And yeah, we need to attack that and we need to change that if we want to save literature and fantasy literature. All right, let's talk about context here. See, this doesn't come out of nowhere. I know people often say, say, yeah, well, probably he's bitter that he's not selling as much as J.R. Tolkien, and I can't fully deny that, but I don't think that's the point here. The point is a different one. We need to look at context here. See, science fiction and fantasy, there's basically one way science fiction and fantasy was produced for a long time, and that's not the Tolkien way. It is the way of the magazines, whether it's the pulp magazines like Weird Tales in the 30s, or later on others like Fantastic, Astounding, all of these different places, or in Britain, for example, the, world, the magazine New Worlds. We'll come to that in a moment, right? <clears throat> That's how fantasy and science fiction was published. There were short stories, there were parts of novels that were, you know, novels were spread out over several issues. People wrote in, complained about it. <clears throat> editors or groups of editors picked which story to share with the world, or which author to... There's a dialogue. That kind of literature evolved over time. And that's, that's how science fiction and fantasy was done in the 50s, in the 60s, even into the 70s. It did not actually happen in the traditional paperback, much less hardcover market. J.R. Tolkien comes from a very different tradition, and he attacks that tradition in a way. It's on the side and it's easily missed, but it's like the Inklings, C.S. Lewis, um, J.R. Tolkien, and some others that have fallen by the wayside, um, professors, Oxford Dons, with a small group of writers that told each other stories, and they published them as finished books because presumably they had a very different access <clears throat> to the publishing industry than any average science fiction writer at the time. So those books were never, those stories, those thoughts were never exposed to a larger, more hopefully slightly diverse for the times audience, right? No, that's like five or six old white men, conservative old white religious men sitting there telling each other stories and congratulating each other about the quality of their stories. And Mokok points out that that does sometimes lead to sloppy writing or less effort because your friends are telling you you're good. Of course they will, because they're your friends. And now you can look at the dialogue, dialogues between Lewis and Tolkien. You can find all the criticism there, um, which exists. And that's fine, but that does not invalidate Michael Moorcock's point, because it's still a small clique of already privileged people telling each other how great their stories are in the long run and helping each other to shape their stories even when they criticize each other, and them getting privileged access to the hardcover and paperback publishing industry. And yes, I'm aware of the fact that Tolkien typed out his own script because he couldn't afford someone else to type it for him. I'm aware of all these things. I'm not saying those people were super rich, but they still come from a very different background. And that's, that's the important thing. So on the one hand, we have a clique of elites basically confirming their own biases and creating fantasy that then gets priority access to the larger publishing industry. And on the other hand, we have a lot of people trying out all kinds of stuff in a more or less, um, I don't want to call it democratic, but way more open setting uh, discourse where magazine editors, letter writers, other authors interact with each other in the public sphere of these different magazines, shaping the future or that like one specific way of how science fiction and fantasy, which are interchangeable at that time, right, are <clears throat> created and the face of it. And that is what Michael Moorcock is also defending there. That way of doing science fiction, you know, different from the Tolkien way. 
Now remember, I said Michael Moorcock, I, I mentioned New Worlds earlier. Well, Michael Moorcock was the editor of New Worlds. When you see all the authors he published in that magazine in like the 60s and early 70s, right? There's there's great names in that J.G. Ballard, there's um, Samuel R. Delaney, Harlan Ellison, William S. Burroughs, Terry Pratchett, and a lot more, right? You can see those are very different authors that have very different approaches to writing literature. And yeah, most of those are critically acclaimed by now, and they definitely pushed the envelope in a lot of ways of, you know, writing stories using language, doing literature. And this brings us to another political element that is important in the context, right? Moorcock complains bitterly that the, even the American authors writing fantasy that are successful and seen as good, because apparently monetary success up to a point is also seen as quality in that time already, <laughs> right? Um, when they imitate British writing styles. See, Tolkien obviously emulates or harkens back to a more, to an older British style. He is influenced obviously by his own studies, by people like William Morris, possibly Lord Dunsany, people like that who have this historic, more English sounding, you know, style of prose. Whether you like that or not, it's not the point, but he's like American authors that follow that way of telling stories, that style of prose are seen as superior, as successful. There's an idea of an authority, which is through time. It's like, even though Americans might be proud of being independent from England, they still kind of have those daddy issues where they're like, well, but maybe pseudo-medieval British prose is still superior because it's older. And Mokok is like, no, actually, the great American novels of the time, and when you look at American literature at the time, it, there's a lot going on there, right? He's like, there's way more going on there. People are facing forward. They're facing the present and the future, not the past. In their in the way they're doing their writing, in the way they're using their prose, in the way they're, you know, pushing at the limits of genre and language and literature. That's what we should do instead of just staying in the past and not moving forward, developing the art form. There's a very deliberate context, discourse about fantasy literature, genre fiction in general as part of literature, and that's as an ongoing development. And for people like that, and for, from that perspective, emulating Tolkien, who's emulating something from the past, is not the way forward. It is staying stuck in that very specific past where you change humanity, or being humanitarian, slowly into being sentimental while out there, this is also important, right? This is written in 1978 for the first time, it's revised later. This is the rise of Thatcherism. This is the rise of Reaganism in the US, the rise of neoliberalism, where you, yeah, behave like an actual, absolute asshole every day and then retreat into sentimentalism instead of just being actually a human being towards anyone else. That's the background behind that. And he says, like, if we read those kind of books that just coddle us from the rigors out there, instead of actually changing anything, yeah, we will never change the system. So that's the context that I think is important here. Michael Moorcock's not bitter that Elric isn't selling as much as Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Michael Moorcock is bitter that an elitist <laughs> group of privileged um, people and <clears throat> have, you know, privileged access to a part of the publishing industry that the established, or not established, but the, 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 us the other way of doing fantasy and science fiction publishing is does not have. It's that point that he is trying to make. It's a war about, like, how to do fantasy and science fiction literature, not about, on, like, a business level magazines, discourse, out in the open, discussing the field, moving forward, not giving lectures at universities like Tolkien did, or just, you know, telling each other in your smoking room somewhere how good your own prose is. That's not the way to do it for someone like Moorcock. And you can disagree, but it's important to be aware of that. It's not him being bitter because he's outsold. So, we're coming close to the end. And I call this, there's <laughs> literature in politics, and there's politics in literature. I already mentioned that, what we just saw, what I just mentioned, right? The, the difference between the magazine-built, more or less discourse-driven um, publishing of science fiction and fantasy through magazines, journals, that then end up slowly in paperback, right? You see a lot of these classics 
Foundation, Isaac Asimov, even people like that, right? Their stuff was published in magazines and then later bound up into actual, you know, hardcovers, soft covers, and so forth. That way, on the one hand, on, on the other hand, an elite-driven, straight to hardback fantasy and science fiction publishing that is not accessible to a lot of people. And the fact that that elite-driven publishing then also promotes books that are firmly conservative, looking backwards, not trying, you know, aiming to just give, you know, relief from stress without actually ever facing the fact that there might just be something out there that causes that stress. That mild <laughs> anesthetics, right? The, the <laughs> anesthetic, the, the mild British cabbage. That's, that's the politics of literature, because literature is inherently politi political, political, right? Publishing is an industry. People decide who gets published, who does not get published. People decide who's, right, who's successful. That's politics. And that's the argument that Michael Moorcock is making here. It's an argument about like how we should publish, who we should publish, who gets to get published and so forth. Now, it's obviously still mostly about like white men because it's written in the 70s, but that argument is still ongoing. This is basically what we now have with the self-publishing versus traditional publishing discourse. That's where it's headed nowadays. And of course, there is <laughs> there's literature and politics because books are written by people that have political backgrounds. Their views, whether you want to, whether they want to or not, whether they put them in explicitly or not, will form and inform the books they write. And the books we read inform our views, our way of looking at the world, how we do or do not actually engage with the world, change the world or whatnot. So combining those two leads to the consequence that you have to make that political argument, that you have to be aware of how the books that you are reading were made, by whom they were made, and how that actually makes you into a political agent by reading those books. And that's that's the argument behind Epic Pooh. And that's the argument that we need to be aware of. It's not going out and saying, hey, look, Tolkien is children's literature. It's bad children's literature at that, and we shouldn't read it. That's not the point. The point is be aware of how those books become the books that you read and that you think of as great. Great literature does not automatically succeed. There's a long chain from writer through editor, through reviewer, through to the reader. And it is up to us, all of us, in that chain to decide the future course of literature, of fantasy literature, because reading changes minds, and changed minds change the world. If you'd believe that, like I do, then being political is inherent in the act of creating art and in the act of consuming art. And it is up to us to make sure that that stays that way. It is up to us to read more discerningly and to not only question what we like and why we like it, but also who decided that this actually ended up in our laps. Yeah, Epic Pooh was necessary in 1978, and it is still necessary because it points out all of those things. This is an ongoing struggle. It's a discourse, and that discourse gets violent from time to time. It gets energetic. And it gets polemical. This book is not, this essay is not telling us that Lord of the Rings is a crap book. It is telling us that there's a lot more at stake around that book. Anyway, that's my thoughts on Epic Pooh. I hope you enjoyed them or you disagreed with them violently. Anyway, let me know in the comments. I would like to talk to you about it. Um, like, subscribe, share. Um, join the Patreon if you really want to help me out. I would appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.